This is week eight of the Unseen Realm. Uh, we're going to be talking about demonization and what does that mean? And can a Christian be possessed, demonized? What is? What are we talking about here? So, um, first thing I want you to do is turn to First Peter chapter five, please. And a lot of Christians, especially in this country, do not want to talk about spiritual warfare. They don't want to think about the fact that, that Satan is our adversary, that he is even an issue. They would much rather ignore it, okay? Well, I'm a Christian now. Um, I can't be possessed. Therefore, you know, I'm not even going to think about Satan. But that really is contrary to what the New Testament authors were writing. Um, and it's, it's really unfortunate. And I think it's one of the things that's led to the anemia uh, in large measure in, in the church today. So in 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to start with verse 6, but we're going to focus on um, verse 8 and 9. Verse 6, therefore, Paul's, or Peter, not Paul, Peter is drawing a conclusion uh, based on what he wrote previously, that we are to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Now, humility is a mindset of total dependence, that without Him we can do nothing. Okay? It's not a, a mindset of, well, I've got this God. You know, I can beat Satan. No, you can't. If I engage Satan and his minions in my own strength, I am going to get whooped every time. Okay? But when we humble ourselves and depend on the mighty hand of God, he's going to lift us up. He'll exalt us. And then he follows in the same sentence. He says, casting all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. Satan loves to create anxiety, panic, and fear. It's one of the ways he gains a stronghold. You know, and the what-ifs is one of his primary games. And we all have those different areas where we're weak in those what-ifs. For me, it's finances. Well, what if I can't pay the bills? What if we run out of money? What if we got to sell the house? What if, what if I can't keep doing, you know, Exchange Life Ministries after mom passes? What if, you know, there's a whole bunch of serious what-ifs that the enemy throws at me. And I remember it wasn't too long ago, I think I was sitting in a Walmart parking lot before I went in to get stuff, and I was, I was concerned about all this stuff, and the Lord's like, He speaks in my spirit, and He says, do you really think that I'm going to stop providing for you? And I'm like, okay. You know, and it got my attention. I was like, yeah, you're right. And, you know, I got back to the manna concept. He provides what we need today. And, you know, he tells us not to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to take care of itself. And it just was a, a, a gentle Holy Spirit reminder. Let's put it that way. To not give in to anxiety. What overcomes the anxiety? The realization of his great love. His great concern and care. And then he goes on in verse 8. Right on the heels of that, he says, be of sober spirit. In other words, be alert, be aware. <clears throat> okay, if you're drunk, you have no idea what's going on, right? But if you're sober, you're alert and aware. Why? What are we to be alert on about your adversary? This is to every believer. Every believer has an adversary. The devil. Okay? The devil. He prowls about. He is the prince of the power of the air. This realm, this earthly realm is his prowling grounds. He is prowling around like a roaring lion. And I've shared that story with you when I was at the Zurich Zoo waiting for my friends. Um, we decided to meet up at the big cat exhibit, and I couldn't stay inside due to my allergies, so I waited outside by the outdoor section of the exhibit. I had a bush behind me, to my off to my right, and uh, I didn't realize it, but there was a male lion standing on a rock behind the cage, obviously, thankfully. He was a pretty pitiful looking dude, but he let out a roar in my ear. I almost soiled myself. It, it was a terrifying sound. Okay, lions, one of the reasons they roar is to scare their prey. He used fear, paralysis. Okay, when you <gasps> fight or flight, you know that sudden 
thought process of, am I going to live through this? Do I need to do something about this? You, <gasps> exactly what he was doing. Okay. Now, this lion wasn't a legitimate threat to me because he was caged, but still, uh, that sound was terrifying. He prowls about like a roaring lion looking for someone. He is looking for someone to devour, and that word means to gobble him up. Okay? To devour. And who is he looking for? Anybody who's vulnerable. Okay? But Paul, or Peter, sorry, Peter says, resist him, firm in your faith. Now that sounds like Paul, doesn't it? It's like he's repeating Ephesians 6, which we'll get to in a moment. Firm in your faith, standing firm. We're not to give any ground. When you're standing firm, you're not giving ground. Now that is a very key concept in the battle. Knowing, okay, you're taking your thoughts captive, you're repeating truth, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. In other words, you're not the only target. And he goes on, and after you have suffered for a little while, these momentary light afflictions, as Paul would say, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him, this is a wonderful little tag, to him be dominion. Remember who is sovereign. It ain't Satan. Mm -hmm. Okay? He may claim this realm as his domain, but nevertheless, Satan is defeated. Um, just real quick, over to Ephesians 6, where it says, Fine, this is Paul talking, just affirming what we were just talking about. Finally, be strong in the Lord, not in your own strength, but in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on what? The full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And we're not going to get into each piece of armor, which is a good study of its own, but um, the armor of God that, that God has equipped us enables us to stand firm. Again, not giving ground to the schemes of the devil. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against when you go into the office, having had tarot cards read by these other ladies, your battle isn't against the ladies. You need to pray for them for salvation. Your battle is against the spiritual forces of darkness that they just allowed ground in their life to. And you can tell them, you know what? You got no hold on me. Okay? Um, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, powers, world forces of darkness, against spiritual forces of weakness, heavenly places. Again, different Greek words there. Again, indicating there's a different military structure and all that kind of stuff. And um, holy cow, today went fast. For though we walk in the flesh, now I've jumped over to 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, and these are strongholds. And again, by a stronghold, what I mean by that is a pattern of thinking that is infused with hopelessness. This is never going to change. That, um, oh, somebody, uh, let me get the quote right here. It's, it's a stronghold is a mindset impregnated with hopelessness that causes me to accept as unchangeable something that we know is contrary to the will of God. That's a good definition of it. In other words, it's a way of thinking that's impregnated with hopelessness. This is never going to change. Even though I know whatever it is is contrary to what God's will is for me, you know, well, I'm, I'm never going to gain victory over chocolate. I'm never going to gain victory over laziness. I'm never going to gain victory over uh, well, pick an addiction, okay? I'm just, everybody's got their vices, everybody's got their Achilles heel, everybody's got their one thing. As those are excuses. God's given me victory in everything. And so what I got to do is look for the lie. Um, we know, and again, I'm just going to quote this for you, James 4, 7, it says, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and what will he have to do? He has to flee. 
when you're submitted, when you're under the authority and the power and the protection of the Lord, and you stand firm and resist the devil, he flees. He's got no other option. Now, this whole concept of giving ground, um, this it really comes from the Greek word that's used by Paul in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. It says, be angry, don't, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. The word is topos, same word we get topography from. It means giving ground. So where we get an awful lot of questions from folks is, well, why should I bother with spiritual warfare as a Christian? You know, I can't be possessed, can I, right? And the argument goes on. The problem that, that's not really the proper question to ask because the, the word that is used in the Greek that's translated possession, it's unfortunately that they chose this word. Let me, let me um, read a quote by Tim Warner, who is one of the great minds of spiritual warfare from past generation. Um, the, word, the use of the word possession to translate the expression used in the New Greek New Testament to indicate the relationship between demons and people is unfortunate, if not unwarranted. We obtain our English word demon by transliterating the Greek word diamon. Di, we should have done the same with the Greek word diamonazami, something like that. The verb form of the same Greek root. It would then come into the English language as demonize, and we could then speak of the degree to which a person could be demonized, rather than being limited to the either-or option by the possessed or not possessed view. Because when we use that word possession, it indicates in our, what's it bring to our mind? Ownership, okay? Where the will is usurped and under complete control of the demonic. Now, for the unbeliever, that can happen if they are hardcore involved in the occult and are welcoming in these high-level demonic entities that do want to take over. But for the Christian, there is no argument, there is no doubt that when the Holy Spirit takes up residence, the ownership is belonging to the Lord. Okay? But for the Christian, we can give ground. And when we give ground, we're giving the enemy a place to operate, to generate what we call as influence over our thinking where he's interjected because of the power of sin. It's not my master. But like Paul says in Romans 7, it still dwells in the members of my body. Okay? In, in Adam, before I came to Christ, that sin was my commanding officer. When it issued an order, I said, yes, sir. When I was crucified with Christ, I was taken out of that army, buried, raised to newness of life. I'm reborn a civilian. But then if I encounter my commanding officer, I'm like conditioned to say, yes, sir. Okay. You will often see that with folks who were in the military, then their civilian life, they meet their CO, commanding officer, they still salute, they still say, yes, sir. It's conditioned. They don't have to call them, yes, sir, in their civilians. They're no longer under their authority, but it's a respect thing. We don't owe sin any respect, but we get conditioned to think, I got to do what it tells me to do. I got to listen to those anxious thoughts. I got to give in to that fear. I've got to eat that. Yeah, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. You know, no, you don't. Okay, I got to, oh man, there's a whole plethora of things. So, um, the fact that a Christian can be influenced to one degree or another by the God of this world is a New Testament given. <coughs> if not, then why are we instructed to put on the form, full armor of God to take every thought captive or to resist the devil? Okay? And what if we don't put on the armor or stand firm or assume responsibility for what we think? And what if we fail to resist the devil? Then what? Well, we're easy prey for the enemy of our souls. And that's one of the statements Neil Anderson made in one of his books. It's true. 
you know. Um, only eternity will reveal the number of believers who have led unproductive, frustrated lives uh, and of Christian workers who have been forced to forsake their ministries because of the attacks of the enemy. This happens in spite of the fact that the New Testament warnings concerning demonic activity are all addressed to believers. How, res how resist got changed to ignore? <laughs> in so many segments of the church, I do not know. When it did, however, Satan and his forces gained a great strategic advantage. Again, another quote from Mr. Anderson. Um, and they're all good quotes in here. But it is, this is from Clinton Arnold, uh, Associate Professor of Theology out at Talbot. It's likely that any sinful activity that the believer does not deal with by the power of the Holy Spirit can be exploited by the devil and turned into a means of control or influence over the believer's life. Therefore, Christians need to resist. For Paul, there is no middle ground. There is no normal, nominal Christianity. Believers either resist the influence of the evil one who works through the flesh and the world, or they relinquish control of their lives or inf give influence to him to the power of darkness. Giving in to those temptations does not just confirm the weakness of the flesh. It opens up the lives of believers to the influence of the devil and his powers. We need to recognize the supernatural nature of temptation and be prepared to fight it. How do we fight it or to face it? We stand firm in our faith. We take our thoughts captive. We remember what's true. We listen to the Holy Spirit. When the anxiety comes and hits us, we take those what-ifs captive and realize that they originate from the enemy. The Holy Spirit does not deal in what-ifs. Simple example. You know what obsessive control, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder? Checking and rechecking. Checking and rechecking. A certain friend of ours that used to frequent this class used to have a bad case of it, okay? <coughs> checking and rechecking. Crippled her life. Um, I would get this early on where um, in bygone years when I used a curling iron. What if I left the curling iron? I'm going out the door to the, to the office, okay? What if I left the curling iron on? What if I left the coffee pot on? What if I forgot to lock the door? You go back and check and recheck, okay? If I have forgotten to turn the coffee pot off, you know what the Holy Spirit does? He doesn't say what if. He says, he says, Robin, I, you left the coffee pot on, go turn it off. Oh, okay. It's a big difference. But the enemy loves to play games. And one of the things that, that really helps us stand firm and resist is exactly what, what Peter wrote about, because he cares for you. When you remember how loved you are, that nothing can separate you, like Romans 8 talks about, nothing. And he lists the whole thing of, of neither death nor life, angels, principalities, things present, things to come, nor powers, height, or death, or any created thing. Will we be able to separate you from what? The love of God that's in Christ Jesus. What does perfect love do to fear? It picks it up and throws it out. It doesn't just escort it. Oh, please let me see. It picks it up and throws it out. Or if you think about a fishing line, when you're casting, it you're it. you're getting you're this you're it's a long distance, at least for most people. Mm -hmm. Okay, me, I probably reel it back and go cast and hook myself in the process and not get anywhere. <laughs> but anyway, that's why I don't fish. I don't like to eat fish, let alone. I'm not going to eat the fish. Why would I put a hook in its mouth and pull it out? I don't, whatever. It's boring. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if people out there watching this like to fish. Go fish. You're fine. I ain't coming with you. Um, but ask the Lord to show you any areas where you've given ground to the enemy. And uh, we'll talk about that as we progress. How to get free. How to get that ground back. How to walk in that freedom that's already ours in Christ. So it really isn't a question of can Christians be possessed. That's not the point. The point is can they be influenced? The absolute un unequivocal answer is yes. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Three big bullets, bombs, missiles, you know, that he throws at us. So sorry this went so fast. We got started late, but uh, we'll be harping on this a lot more as we progress. 
um, because pretty, we're going to start next week. I think we're probably going to look at um, the apostles, the, the disciples and the apostles and how they dealt with some things in the demonic realm, what they were up against. And then we're going to start moving into uh, the steps to freedom, the different um, areas that we look for where strongholds might be and how to pray through that. And then we're going to talk about intercessory warfare prayer and um, how to intercede for others who are under attack and to stand in the gap for them and how to pray. Okay. All right, let's talk to the Lord now. Father, again, I thank you that you are sovereign over all things. There is no entity on the face of this earth in the heavens above or the earth below or in any realm of existence that is greater than you. And I thank you that because we're in you and you're in us, that sovereignty passes over to us. We, we have no need to fear because you care for us. You love us. And that your love picks up that fear and casts it out, casts out anxiety. So, Lord, enable us by the power of the Holy Spirit to take our thoughts captive, to bring them back to truth, to stand firm in our faith, to use the full armor of God, and to resist the devil. Standing firm, he will flee. We give you glory for that. We thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> All right, ladies, thank you for your patience. We'll see you next week.